Thank you, David. Excuse me. My biggest weakness, as I've discovered in traveling around the country, is not the, um, the writer's cramp that people keep assuming I get at these book signings. It's my voice. So I appreciate very much a public address system. I hope it's not necessary. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it is a pleasure to be in Baton Rouge. As I said, I've covered, a, uh, covered the country, all four corners, this summer. Fifty-nine cities uh, encompassed the book tour. This has been an extraordinary event in my life, a unique event in my life. Um, it was 30 years ago, uh, exactly, that my father took his family, his then 14-year-old son, who uh, was a rabid Civil War uh, fan. When I was a kid, I was playing with Civil War soldiers when my friends were playing with their World War II soldiers. And so there was value to taking his family as tourists to a place like Gettysburg. And we went, as millions of people do now every year, and as may, probably many of you have done, and we wandered the battlefield. Um, there was no agenda on my father's part. This was not a trip to research a book. And yet from walking the ground, something profoundly affected him, and he carried it home with him. And I can very distinctly remember what I can best describe as an obsession on his part, which produced seven years later the Killer Angels. What most people do not know is that The Killer Angels was anything but a success. In 1974, when the book was being shopped around New York, 73, 74, the book was turned down by the first 15 publishers who saw it. Uh, this was the end of the Vietnam War, and absolutely nobody wanted to read a book about war. The Killer Angels, if you've read it, you understand that this is a book that essentially, in some ways, celebrates generals. And in 1974, in the United States, we were not in the mood to especially celebrate generals. The book was eventually published by the David McKay Company. It was a small independent publisher in New York City. And the David McKay Company was going out of business. They were going down the tubes. They had no money. So even after the announcement of the publication of the book, you couldn't find it. You couldn't get it in the bookstore. And people were calling my father's house from all over the country saying, I'm trying to buy your book. After the Pulitzer Prize in 75, uh, with all the publicity around that, you would assume that that would open all kinds of doors and that would create a bestseller and so forth, as it does today. And that did not happen to the Killer Angels. When the book was released in paperback in 1975 by Ballantyne, right around the same time Random House, who owns Ballantyne, sort of scooped up the David McKay Company and inherited the rights to publish the Killer Angels. But they never put out a hardcover edition of the book until 1993. The paperback of the book sort of slid along. The, the best description of the paperback, I've been told, is that it became a cult book. People who were rabid Civil War fans knew of the book, many history professors, but it never was, by anybody's definition, a success. My father never considered it his achievement as anything to rest his laurels on, as anything to rely on to open other doors for him. He went on to write other books. Uh, in fact, what he had hoped to do to the end of his life, what he thought was going to be his monument, was to write a book on the story, uh, write a story on the life of Shakespeare. To tell the story in a novel from, the, from Shakespeare's own point of view, from inside Shakespeare's own mind, very much the way The Killer Angels is written. That was the project that he was working on right till the end of his life, and it never came. In 1978, a filmmaker named Ron Maxwell called my father and said, I've just read your book, and I think there's a film here, and I'd like to work on this with you. And the two men spent the next 10 years beating their heads against the wall, trying to get someone to put the money up to make a film from the Killer Angels. There was one television network who actually inked a deal, actually produced a contract for a miniseries, and at the last minute, an executive of that network pulled the plug because his rationale was, wait a minute, there are no women in this story. We can't put anybody in a negligee. Nobody's going to want to watch this. After all, it's a story about a bunch of guys. That kind of reasoning drove my father right up the wall. And in 1988, his health finally caught up with him. He had his first heart attack when he was very young, when he was only 36. His heart disease finally caught up with him when he was 59, and he died of heart disease. To Ron Maxwell's enormous credit, he kept the fire burning for the Killer Angels. Ron, to give you an idea of Ron's commitment to this project, at one point he had the option of selling the rights to a major studio or losing his home in New York City. And he lost his home. 
and kept the rights. In 1991, there was a party in honor of Ken Burns, after Ken Burns' enormous success with the Civil War series on PBS, which Ken himself credits much of the inspiration to reading The Killer Angels. And Ken Burns approached Ted Turner at this party and said, I've got the phone number of a man you need to talk to. There's a fellow out there trying to make a movie out of this book, and this is a book you need to read. And that resulted in what became the film Gettysburg. The irony of this, and there are many ironies, but one of the ironies is on October 8, 1993, which is the day the film Gettysburg was released in theaters around the country, it's the first day that The Killer Angels became a bestseller. It debuted on the New York Times bestseller list at number 14. It spent 15 weeks on the list, spent four weeks at number one. So the double irony is that not only did my father not live to see his book become a film, he did not live to see anything he wrote become a bestseller. In January of 94, after the clear success of Gettysburg and the enormous public acceptance of this and the fact that it did elevate the Killer Angels to bestseller status, Ron called me. We had become friends during the filming of Gettysburg. And he said, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful to continue the story of these characters? Because after all, the story of these characters does not begin and end on the battlefield at Gettysburg. And wouldn't it be wonderful to go before and after and tell the story of these same people and bring in the wives, the women, tell the, the story from a very personal way before the war and after. And we should really do this from a book. And he was sort of vague about the way he expressed that. And my first thought was, well, yeah, this is a great idea. Um, I'd never written anything. I had no ideas of writing a book like this. My father had taught creative writing at Florida State for many years, and my thought was, well, some of his students had gone on to become published authors. Some were desperately trying to be published. And I thought, maybe I should talk to some of these people and see if someone's interested in taking this on as a task. And about a week went by, and I realized two things. First of all, I realized that what Ron was doing was passing the sword. And also, that if anyone is going to write and continue my father's story, it should be me. And so I called Ron back after about a week, and I said, you know, I think I'd like to try to write this book. And his response was, I've been waiting for your call. I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. I, on the other hand, had absolutely no clue what I was doing. And I approached this with a couple of things in mind. I remembered very vividly walking the ground at Gettysburg and how that affected my father. And so I knew I had to travel, I had to go to the places, I had to go to Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and to visit these places and the Confederate Museum in Richmond, um, to go to Maine, to go to California, to visit the sites I was gonna write about and hope that whatever happened to my father in some way happened to me. And so I went to Richmond and I visited the Confederate Museum, had a wonderful tour there and some of you may know this, but driving from Richmond up to Fredericksburg on I-95, about 10 miles south of Fredericksburg, there's a big gold sign next to the interstate that says the Stonewall Jackson Shrine. I had no idea what that was. I thought, well, I guess I should go look at this thing. I pulled off the interstate, drove a couple miles down this country road, and came to what was the Chandler Plantation, and the plantation house is long gone. It's marked by four posts in the ground. And what did survive, though, is the small two-story frame house in which Stonewall Jackson died. It has been preserved. It is a park. It's a federal park. There is a ranger there who seems to be a very fairly lonely man. This is not a place where people happen upon. And he was glad for the company. I introduced myself. He was very familiar with my father's work. And we talked for a while. Then he just let me alone. And I stood in the bedroom, which was an office converted to a bedroom, where the bed and the blanket on the bed and the clock on the mantelpiece are original. And I realized as I was listening in the absolute silence to the ticking of this clock that I was hearing the sound that Dr. Hunter McGuire writes about at the moment that Jackson stopped breathing from the harsh, the harsh high, raspy breathing of the pneumonia that, that was killing him. The moment he stopped breathing, everybody in the room looked at the clock because it was the only sound suddenly in the stark silence. And I realized I was listening to the same sound. And without trying to be melodramatic about it, I will have to say that much like what my father experienced at Gettysburg, it was a moment that changed my life. And I knew that unlike the idea, which would be to follow my father's characters exactly, which on the southern side would mean Lee and Longstreet from the Killer Angels, that I had to tell the story of Jackson. From there, I went to Lexington, Virginia, where Jackson is buried, and there's the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery, 
And in the middle of this cemetery is this giant monument to Jackson. It was put there in 1891 and with a great ceremony and so forth. And Jackson's body was moved to that point along with the body of his family, uh, subsequent families. And over to one side, I was thrilled to see that they had the wisdom to leave the original grave site where Jackson was originally buried. And he's buried alongside his month-old daughter who died of breathing complications, as I say, at a month old, and she's buried alongside him. And behind his grave is the grave of Ellie Jackson, who was his first wife, who died in childbirth. And she's buried with her stillborn infant. And her family is buried there. And then I began to look around this graveyard and realize all these names of all these people that were coming alive from my research, coming alive in here, were all around me. And it was a profound experience. I would suggest anyone who has an interest in this go to this place. I had to go back to Richmond the next morning, and I thought, well, I should stop one more time at the, at the cemetery. And it was very early in the morning. It was about 7 a.m. It was dense fog, and it was a very gothic scene. And it was a little strange walking out in a cemetery under those conditions. But I thought, well, I should go one more time. And I went out to the cemetery to the grave. And in the meantime, someone had placed a lemon on Jackson's grave. If that has no significance to you, I understand. All I can say is you have to read Gods and Generals. Um, it had a great deal of significance to me, um, and I took it as a sign, and I said, okay, you don't have to beat me over the head with this. This is a story I want to tell. And that began what I can only describe as a love affair with the character of Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. This is a man that we learn about in our high school or college history often as a cartoon. This is a man who is painted as a religious fanatic or a man who is a, or just a, rab a killer on the battlefield. And yet what I learned by reading Anna's, his wife's book, and by reading other stories of the people who knew him on a personal level, this is a marvelous character. This is a man who had a great love of his family, a man with a deep devotion to the whole idea of family, a man who wanted nothing more than to go home and spend the rest of his life with his wife and his, and his to-be-born children. And also a man who could be childlike around children and yet very awkward around his own staff. He didn't know how to laugh. Sandy Pendleton, uh, his chief of staff, described him in these staff meetings where they would be kidding and joking and Jackson would be standing there very stoically, betraying no smile or no humor and very awkwardly, very shyly, and suddenly he would burst out laughing at a joke that he would miss until maybe five minutes later. And Sandy Pendleton described him as a man who laughed like he didn't know how. Um, and add to that the fact that this man on the battlefield was probably the greatest commander of infantry we have ever produced in this country. Um, it's a marvelous character. The risk, the challenge of writing about a character like this is that I know the history, I knew the history going in, as do you, and so the ultimate result is to have a love affair with a character that you eventually have to kill. And I will tell you that writing the death of Jackson, which is not giving anything away, but to write the death of Jackson was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Um, this was not an attempt to mimic the Killer Angels. Um, many people have asked me if the style of writing, if I'd set out to do that. Um, the styles are very similar. I noticed that, actually it was my sister who pointed that out, who said this book is being written by the ghost of Michael Shara. Um, I didn't set out to mimic his style because I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do that and get away with it for very long. Um, it just came out that way. Um, I'm remarkably fortunate for that. Um, the fact that uh, I am following in my father's footsteps, as, as David so kindly put it, um, is extremely intimidating. Um, when I sat down to write this book, I had no expectations. I had absolutely no idea that this is what I should be doing. And I give full credit to the publisher at Ballantyne, Claire Ferraro, who said to me, um, not only do we think you're a writer and we think you need to be doing more of this, um, but we'd like you to do the sequel. And so that's what's next, is I w eventually this will be a trilogy with the Killer Angels in the center. The next book will begin exactly where the Killer Angels ends at the conclusion of Gettysburg and bring in the character of Ulysses Grant, which is a character I'm very much looking forward to writing.
Um, one other point about the characters in Gods and Generals, there are four main characters. Lee and Jackson on the southern side, Hancock and Chamberlain on the northern side. Two of these characters are directly from the Killer Angels, and that's Lee and Chamberlain. The other characters are not in the Killer Angels. Hancock is mentioned frequently, but he is not a character in the Killer Angels. And so it was fascinating for me to get to know this man because Hancock is Michael Shara. Uh, it was an astonishing thing for me to read his wife, Myra Hancock, wrote her own book, a marvelous source of information. And I'm reading about this character who had Michael Shara's temper and Michael Shara's impatience. And at the same time, here's a man who was very, very good at everything he tried to do. And that also very much describes Michael Shara. Um, so that was a joy. It was a joy for me to learn, and it was also a joy for me to write about. And as I've said, the other character who was not in Killer Angels is, for obvious reasons, is Jackson. So the challenge on the next book is, who else? And the logical choice is Grant. So I've begun the research already. I hope to be writing by the early spring. I have an enormous volume of Grant's papers and a number of other things. The other characters will be Lee, certainly, and Longstreet and Stewart, to whatever extent. I don't know yet. I'll know when I get there. And of course, Chamberlain and Hancock, and again, to what extent, I don't know. But that's what will be coming next. Um, I would like to just conclude this part of, of what I'm doing here by saying that I had an enormous opportunity to give something back to my father. Um, I have no illusion that I am standing here and not Michael Shara because of a, a whole variety of circumstances over which I had no control. Um, and that I am standing here and telling you about a book that I have written is something that I will never take for granted in the fact that this was a huge door that my father opened for me. Um, it was my sister who said, look, as long as you understand that every single reviewer is going to start their review by saying, well, it's no killer angels. As long as you understand that, go for it. And so, in, indeed, many of the reviews have been exactly that. Fine. That was not an attempt. This was not competition. In 1970, I was with my father when he returned to the battlefield at Gettysburg. Again, I'd say he had already had his first heart attack, and he was not in good physical shape. He could not do many of the things that we would do as tourists. He could not climb Little Round Top or Big Round Top. He could not go down through Devil's Den. He simply couldn't do it physically. That was my job. I was the kid. So he would say, go over there in those bushes and find out what's there. And so I'd go on my hands and knees. And, and what I have to say about that is it was probably the best time in my life in my relationship with my father. It was probably the best time we ever had. And it was a time that I will always remember as very, very precious. So, when he died in 1988, and we were going through his things, one of the things we discovered in his files was a manuscript, a baseball novel, that he had written in the late 70s, at a time when baseball was distinctly out of fashion. I mean, if anything else, Michael Shower was a master of bad timing. I mean, The Killer Angels, a perfect example. This baseball novel, another great example. In the meantime, Robert Redford had made The Natural, and you had Bull Durham and Field of Dreams and all these wonderful baseball stories, and baseball was, again, quite fashionable. So I took this manuscript to New York, and it was published by Carolyn Graff, a small independent New York publisher. My father had given up on this manuscript. In fact, we're lucky he didn't throw it away. That was his frame of mind at the time. He had shopped it everywhere, and nobody was interested. When well, the book is now called For Love of the Game. It will be out actually in paperback next spring. It's coming out. Ballantine is putting it out. And Universal has optioned it for a, a motion picture. In fact, I just noticed last week Kevin Costner was quoted in The Hollywood Reporter. He wants to make the film. Uh, another irony that my father did not live to see. But the moment that Kent Carroll, the publisher at Carroll and Graff, handed me the first copy of For Love of the Game, I was struck very much off guard by the emotion of the moment because I realized this was my gift to my father. This was something I could give him that he could not give himself. And so now, with all that has happened to me, this extraordinary summer, the fact that I have written a book that debuted on the bestseller list, um, that I you know, did not spend 40 years of my life perfecting my craft and won a Pulitzer Prize, as my father did, but that I have sort of launched into this on his heels uh, and that I'm standing here in front of you um, is something I will never take for granted. And I, again, thank you for, for, um, for listening to this. What I would like to do, I have been asked to read, and there is one requirement which must 
precede that, which is this, sorry. This is a fairly new thing, and I'm not happy with it at all. Um, <laughs> what I would like to read to you, I have learned, um, I'm going to read to you two small pieces, uh, and I promise they're small. Um, one of the things I learned, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. In the Battle of Fredericksburg, and I'm not going to read you a battle scene. That would be easy. Um, action is always easy to relate to an audience. But after the first day of the Battle of Fredericksburg, you have the soldiers, the, the soldiers of Hancock's brigade division are the ones who get closest to what is an impregnable Confederate position. You have what Fredericksburg is, for those of you who don't know the history, and very briefly, it is an extraordinarily boneheaded attack by the Federal Army, by General Ambrose Burnside commanding. What Lee has done, Lee has entrenched on a hill. He has cannon and rifle pits all over the face of this hill. At the bottom of this hill is a sunken road behind a stone wall so that the Confederate soldiers can stand chest high behind this wall. The man, the, they stand in a row four deep, so the man in front can fire his musket, hand it back, receive another one, and fire it immediately, so there's no delay in the firing. Into this position, the Federal Army must march their soldiers across a half a mile of open ground that's cut by fence lines and cut by one deep canal that's filled with icy water. This is December of 1862. It is cold. There is some snow on the ground. And these troops must march across this open field into the guns of these Confederate soldiers. Hancock's troops are in the first wave. They make it to within 25 yards of the stone wall. The mission has been, arrogantly enough, to sweep the Confederates from this hill and march over and destroy Lee's army. They don't even get to the stone wall. Chamberlain is in the reserves. Chamberlain has never been in a battle. He is new to the army. He has witnessed the Battle of Antietam from the rear. He's in the reserves at Antietam, is never called into battle, and so he has never marched against the guns. Today, the reserves are called in, and today he will march against the guns. However, as night falls, no one in the incredible carnage, confusion, the smoke, the terror of the battle, the terror of the moment, no one gives the order to retreat. So as the sun goes down on the battlefield, these Union troops have nowhere to go but to lay down flat on the ground out in front of the stone wall. There is a depression in the ground where they can lay down out of sight of the rifles. Um, the depression is still there today. The Park Service building sits basically right in the middle of it. And Chamberlain finds himself there with the sun going down on a freezing night in December. And this is what occurs. Um, there are references to two characters here. One is Ames. It's Colonel Adelbert Ames, who is the commander of Chamberlain's regiment, the 20th Maine. Chamberlain, at this point, is second in command. The other character, and if you've seen the film Gettysburg, you know the character I'm referring to, is Tom. Tom Chamberlain, Chamberlain's younger brother, who is also a member of the regiment. So I'd like to read to you just briefly of what Chamberlain's experience is, and I'd also like to remind you as I'm reading this, this is all true. There were men all around him, voices and cries, and he lay without moving, staring up at the darkness, the night sky. What was left of the regiment and of the brigade was lying flat around him in the depression, out in front of the stone wall, and for today it was over. He could feel the cold of the ground under his back, felt it creeping up into his hands and arms and feet, and he thought, this is not good, we will freeze to death. They had heavier coats, of course, had left them in the town, had left everything in the town except what they would need to fight, but they were still out here, still facing the enemy, and would have to wait through a freezing night before anything else would happen, before there could be any relief. He began to shiver, flexed his fingers, wrapped himself with his arms, and now shivered more. He raised his head just slightly and looked around him and saw a great field of black shapes. He began to move, slid along the hard ground, moved up alongside one of the shapes, said in a low, hoarse voice, You there, are you wounded? He waited, then reached out a hand, touched the blue cloth, prodded harder, poked the man's stiff body, and he understood. Truly sorry, old fellow, but I need to... He slid closer, pressed his body up against the mask, grabbed the man's loose coat, unwrapped the body slightly, pulled a flap out over him, and lay still again. But it was not enough. He rose up, saw another mass a few feet up the rise, pulled himself along, prodded again, and again there was no reply. As he slid back down, he grabbed the man's foot, pulled him down the hill, put the man on the other side of him, pulled another flap of coat out over him. 
Now he lay between them, thought, all right, so now you will be warm. It had been dark for about an hour, and he began to hear new sounds, the numbness of the shock, the natural anesthetic of the wounded giving way to the raw pain. The sounds began to grow, spreading out over the entire field, soft cries broken by short screams, words and meaningless noises, curses and prayers. The sounds filled his mind, there was no shutting them out, and he stared up at the stars, tried to see beyond the sounds, but they pulled him back. There were other voices now as well, the men who were not wounded, who were scattered through the others, through the lifeless forms as he was, and they began to shout, some of them yelling at the wounded to stop, to be quiet. Some were angry, loud, hostile screams, others begged, pleaded. He kept staring up, distracting himself, trying not to hear, but the sounds were now filling every space and his head began to throb. The sounds were coming from inside, louder now, no voices, no words, but a steady high scream, and he felt his head would burst, his mind shattering, blowing into a thousand pieces, the pieces of the men around him. And then he was suddenly awake. The sound was gone, and he felt the cold again, felt the hard masses pressing on him from either side. Above him there was a face, a man crouching low over him, and the man pulled the flaps back, looked at him, and Chamberlain said, excuse me, but I was sleeping. The man jumped, lurched back, said in a burst, for the love of God, and crawled away, sat for a moment in the dark, said in a whisper, sorry, I thought you was with the beyond. Chamberlain raised himself up, could see across the field. Now the moon had come up, and men were moving around, crawling among, among the dead, pulling off coats and shirts and boots. There were men with stretchers, lifting some of the wounded, carrying them back toward the wagons, waiting far behind the lines. The sounds of the wounded were still there, but not as many, softer sounds, and he thought, many have died, maybe the lucky ones. He propped himself upon his elbows, told him, you're in command, maybe you should, this had never been discussed, Ames had not told him what to do in this situation. Ames, he wondered if he was alive. He crawled out from the shelter of the body, slid along painfully, then saw more of the stretcher bearers standing, and he rose to his knees, tried to look around. He wanted to say something, to call out how many were still alive. Tom. Tom. He felt a burst of cold in his gut. Tom! The noise exploded through the cold night, and he listened, waited, and then he heard other voices, other yells. Tom! And laughing, and he looked that way, over the hill, toward the stone wall, and now there were more voices. Tom! You home, Tom? And along the hill, across the field, his own men began to take up the call. No Tom here! Hey Tom, you got a message! He felt a rush of anger, wanted to yell again, and now he heard another voice. One single sound from below him, down in the bottom of the wide depression. Lawrence! He started to rise, to stand up, thought, I can see the moon is bright, maybe I can see where he is. And suddenly there was a flash, several more, and he dropped down, lay flat, and around him other men began to yell, keep it down, stay down, you'll draw fire. He lay still for a minute, raised himself up slowly, thought, he is alive, thank God. He turned, crawled back up to his bed, stood in tight between the bodies, pulled again at the flaps of cloth. There were clouds now moving across the face of the bright moon, and he could see fewer stars. There was a new sound, the wind, a steady growing breeze, and he thought, no, please, no storm, no snow, not tonight. But the clouds were thin, the moon was still there, shining through. The breeze flowed across the field, and he rose one more time, felt the sharp chill, lay back down, said in a low whisper to the bodies, to his shelter, God forgive me. He lay still for a long time, watched the clouds slide past the moon, and the wind began to change, to shift direction, and suddenly there was a noise, a rustle, a knocking. He sat up, looked to the side, up over the rise, saw a dark shape in the distance, a battered house. The noise came from there, but he could see nothing. He lay back down, and the noise kept coming, and he tried to imagine what it was, pictured a house in his mind. The wind thought, a window. And he knew it was a curtain, a blind slapping against an open window frame. He felt relief, let out a long breath. He lay still again, and the noise still came, the sound growing, pushing everything else away. And his mind was filled again, and the noise became words, a hard, cold whisper. Never forever. Never forever. Thank you. Um, I have read this passage to audiences around the country because I like it. And I learned a lesson about the concept of know your audience. Um, when I was in Atlanta, I read this to a book signing, and uh, as I finished it, a gentleman in the back stood up and said, yeah, well, if we'd have shot straighter, you wouldn't have had to write that chapter. Uh, it was a lesson learned, and so 
when I was in many other cities around the Deep South, particularly, um, I decided I shouldn't read a Chamberlain chapter, maybe I should read something else. Um, what I would like to do is read to you of Stonewall Jackson. Um, and this is short, I promise, again. And again, it, it needs, requires a bit of explanation. The Battle of Chancellorsville. What happens here is you have an extraordinary force of Union soldiers under the command now of Joe Hooker, Fighting Joe, who leads his men in a big circle around behind Lee. The idea, Lee is still behind the hills at Fredericksburg. The idea of Hooker's is a very good idea. If he can divide his army and leave a big force in front of Lee at Fredericksburg and divide the army and bring a bunch of people around the back, he can crush Lee between the two wings of the army because Hooker outnumbers Lee by better than two to one. So what happens is Hooker brings the soldiers down across the river. They get behind Lee and at the last minute Hooker freezes. All the momentum is with the Union Army, and he simply orders them to stop, to dig in, to form a defensive position. The position they form is in the shape of a spoon. So you have the round part, which is essentially facing Lee, and then you have the stem of the spoon, which is sticking out, actually, from your perspective, the other way, sticking out to the west. And there are no Confederate soldiers out there, so these men feel as though they're the furthest from the fighting, they're the least in danger of confronting the enemy, they don't even dig trenches. Lee finds this out from Jeb Stuart, that the Union right wing is in the air, as they call it. And so Lee and Jackson devise this plan for Lee to divide his army, which is already tremendously outnumbered, divide the army in the face of the enemy, which every military textbook tells you is not the thing to do. Jackson will march with approximately 30,000 troops by some roads that evade sight of the Union position, get around the end of the Union line, and attack that flank. The idea being, if they can attack the flank, they can roll up the whole flank and possibly destroy the entire Union Army. Lee is left with a force of about 12 or 13,000 men confronting a force in front of him of 70,000. If Hooker should happen to regain his nerve and move out of his trenches, Lee will be instantly destroyed. The march takes longer than expected. They anticipate about a 12-mile march. They should be able to do this in about half a day. But they don't get there until late in the afternoon. Jackson is observed all the way along the march by federal observers who are in the tops of trees and in observation towers. They can see this Confederate column marching around their right flank. And panicked observers all day long tell their commanders, there's an army out there. The commanders, the, the Union division is, uh, on that end is commanded by Oliver Howard. And he tells his man, the 11th Corps, he tells these messengers, yeah, Lee is retreating. They send messages back to Joe Hooker, and Joe Hooker is convinced Lee is leaving. And so all day long, they watch these soldiers march what they believe is away. And even when the soldiers see the gray troops begin to form on their end, and they're panicking, saying, one soldier is quoted as saying, for God's sake, make disposition to receive them, the Union commanders still don't believe it. One of the reasons they don't believe it is because what these soldiers must march through in order to attack is the wilderness. At this time, the wilderness is secondary growth forest. All the big trees have been cut by local foundries and, and charcoal mills around the area. And so what has grown up instead is briars, brush, a dense undergrowth that is no place to fight a battle. And so they don't believe troops can even come through this. There's certainly no way to get horses or guns through it or cannon through it. And so the, the Federal Army is entirely confident that this, these people on the end of the line, Howard's troops, are going to see no action at all. All the fighting is on the other side. Lee's job is to make a demonstration, make noise, try to hold Hooker right where he is. During the day, Dan Sickles, the federal commander, is watching. He's basically at the bottom of the spoon. He's watching this line of troops go by him. He can't stand it. He has to advance. He sends some of his people down. They see wagons. He hits the wagon train. It's the wagon train of, of the last division, A.P. Hill's division. And he slams into the wagon train, captures a regiment of Georgia soldiers, and at least does something because that's the kind of man Sickles is. But the rest of the army just sits there. And the other, and as before, there will be a couple of names here. One is you have two division commanders besides A.P. Hill, 
who is bringing up the rear. You have Rhodes and Colston, who are the two division commanders under Jackson. These are men who have been to VMI with Jackson, who know him quite well. And they are in command of the, of the first two divisions who arrive around on the end of the flank. I would just like to read to you very briefly what occurs at that moment. The column reached the turnpike and Rhodes quickly led a line of skirmishers out down the turnpike to the east toward the farthest point of the federal position. The men filed out into the brush, began to feel their way through. Jackson sat high in the middle of the road and watched. Now he could hear the guns from far out in front of him, a roll of low thunder. He gauged the distance, knew it was Anderson, McClaws, and Lee on the far side of the federal position, and he nodded, thought, good, they are still engaged, still in place. He felt the thrill again, the excitement of knowing the entire federal army was right in front of him, between him and Lee, right there. Others were beside him now, his own staff, and now Rhodes was back, and his division was filling the road, spreading out in thick battle lines into the woods. Jackson began to rock in the saddle, a small rhythm back and forth, pushing the men into position. With each forward movement, he said to himself, go, move forward. The men were having some difficulty. It was slow going, and he wanted to yell, tell them to hurry, but there could be no noise. And so he prodded them from inside his head, leaned out over the horse, then back in the saddle. It was getting late, but he would not look at the sun, far behind them now, dropping quickly toward the distant trees. He saw his own shadow on the road, long and dark, and he closed his eyes, would not see it, kept pushing them, rocking. It was Colston now, and the second division moved into lines behind roads, the men swarming past Jackson's horse. Most did not look up now, knew it was soon. Then Colston was beside him, wanted to say something. He was nervous, had not led a division into battle before, and still Jackson rocked, his eyes closed. Colston watched him, let it go, turned to his troops again. Jackson suddenly stopped moving, looked sharply behind him, saw Pendleton and said, where is Hill? Pendleton was startled, moved closer. General Hill will be up with his lead brigade very soon, he said. He is not more than a mile behind. His last two brigades are well back, sir. They have not been able to make up for the lost time for the fight with the Yankees. Jackson turned, closed his eyes again, was suddenly furious, felt a stab of pain in his side. His chest tightened and he tried to breathe, opened his mouth and the tightness gave way. Hill again. It was good Hill was last in line. They could move without him if they had to. Rhodes was still close by, heard the brief conversation, felt defensive about Hill, said, Sir, General Hill was pressed by a large force of Federals. I am certain he is bringing his men up as quickly as he can. Jackson stared at him, a withering glare, and Rhodes looked away, had crossed a dangerous line with his commander. Jackson closed his eyes and slowly began to rock again. Colston's lines were almost in place now, and Jackson spurred his horse, moving down the road toward the back of, his, of Rhodes' troops, with Rhodes moving quickly to catch up with him. Jackson reached the line of men, leaned over, and tried to see out into the thick brush. The line disappeared in both directions, the men slowly moving forward with small noises, the officers keeping them in line. Jackson heard curses and nervous laughter, could hear the sounds of the brush, the men stepping through the tangle. He looked down the road, lifted his field glasses, stared ahead, and saw two small black eyes the silent stare of Howard's cannon. Lowering the glasses, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small gold watch, 5.15. They would have two hours of daylight. Rhodes said nothing, waited, and Jackson now looked at him hard, tried to see into the man's soul, measure the strength of his heart. Rhodes still waited, felt the power of Jackson's cold blue stare. Jackson said, are you ready, General Rhodes? Yes, sir, Rhodes did not pause. You can go forward, sir. Rhodes turned and there was a quick shout and a bugle sound that and out in front the first line began to crush through the tangle of briars and thickets. From far out in both directions came the sound, the high screaming wail of 10,000 men, a solid line a mile wide pushing and clawing through the brush in one great mass of motion. The terrible sound echoed far in front of them, carried forward by the wind, and before them, beyond the brush, in the wide clearings along the road, heads began to turn and plates of hot food were spilled, and the men in blue coats stood, staring at the impossible, the impenetrable thicket, stared as the deer and the rabbits and the birds ran and darted and flushed out before the great wave. Before the first man was seen, or the first musket aimed, the men in blue were swallowed by the sound, by the raw terror, and they began to run. Thank you. <clears throat> the problem with reading that section is I want to keep going.
Um, and I hope you do as well. And I thank you all very much for coming. And at this point, I would open this up to questions any of you might have, either about my father, about the film, um, about gods and generals, um, whatever. And anyone, please. Please don't be shy. Uh, I will throw out a piece of trivia to you. Uh, there are many pieces of trivia uh, I'm often asked about. The park rangers, the guides on the battlefield at Gettysburg, uh, came up to me when I was there this summer and said that they have now incorporated this into their own talks. Uh, there is a monument to the 20th Maine on top of Little Round Top on which are listed all the names of the dead. Conspicuously absent from that list is the name of Buster Kilrain. Those of you who are familiar with the Killer Angels and with the film Gettysburg know that Buster Kilrain is the Irish sergeant who is essentially Chamberlain's sidekick, Chamberlain's um, staff officer. Uh, Buster Kilrain is the only character in the Killer Angels and in the film Gettysburg who is a completely fictitious character. Buster Kilrain is Michael Shara. It was my father's way of putting himself into his own story. And if you think about the film, the marvelous scene in the film between the actor Kevin Conway, who portrays Buster Kilrain, and Jeff Daniels as Chamberlain, they're sitting under a tree, and Kilrain is the cynic. He is the man sent there by the storyteller to essentially counter what my father saw as Chamberlain's um, sort of blind idealism. And so it is Buster Kilrain when Chamberlain says, when he's referring to being raised by his mother, a very religious woman, that all men have the peace of the angel. And it is Kilrain who says, well, if man is an angel, then he is a killer angel. And so it is Kilrain who gives us the title to the book. Um, the park ranger said, would you please inform people of the fact that Buster Kilrain is a fictitious character? Because every time they lead a group of people on top of the round top, someone always says, how come I don't see Buster Kilrain's name on the monument? So in case any of you wondered. Um, and in fact, Kevin Conway had an extraordinarily difficult job as an actor because every other actor in the film Gettysburg had a real character to draw on, and he did not. And so he had to do with what he could, and I think he did a magnificent job. And in fact, I've, been, I've actually had people challenge me on this and say, well, wait a minute, because at the beginning of the film, they show a picture of the real character and a picture of the actor, this wonderful way of opening the film, uh, which was Ron's design. When they get to Kevin Conway, to Buster Kilrain, they show a picture of a Union soldier and Kevin Conway. And people say, well, of course he was real. I saw him. Well, what they did is they found a photograph of the most anonymous Union soldier they could find so that no one would come up later and say, wait a minute, that's my great-grandfather. Um, and that's how he became Buster Kilrain. So, <clears throat> anyone? Yes? Did you and your father what kind of difference Jackson would have made at Gettysburg? Well, the speculation of Jackson being at Gettysburg is probably one of the most pivotal speculations about the whole war. Um, I can't speak for my father, but I will say that, um, in my opinion, clearly, um, I can't say that the South would have won the Battle of Gettysburg had Jackson been there, but I think what would have happened is Jackson would have taken Cemetery Hill, which Ewell failed to do. Ewell froze, essentially. and. Jackson clearly would have seen the value of a basically unoccupied hill or very lightly occupied hill, and Jackson would have been on top of the hill. What that would have done to the Battle of Gettysburg probably would have prevented there ever being a Battle of Gettysburg. Um, probably Meade would have, or Reynolds, Hancock, would have pulled the Union Army back to another location, and it might have been called the Battle of Lancaster or, or something, and we would have never heard of Gettysburg. Um, beyond that, Certainly his presence in the Army in general, not just at Gettysburg, was a huge factor. And I think that's what led Lee to order Pickett's charge. Because up till that time, he had Jackson leading those charges. And now, uh, I think it took Lee a while to understand just how much of an impact Stonewall Jackson had on his army. So, anyone else? Has there been a discussion about film of at least maybe a portion of your book, since I guess it's so wide sweeping they could be the time. There is a first draft of a, the screenplay, which I finished back a few months ago. Um, it is exactly twice the length of the screenplay of Gettysburg. Um, that's sort of a problem. Uh, Are you concentrating on more than one battle? Well, 
what we're trying to do, Ron Maxwell and I are working together on this to develop this as a film, and it almost would have to be a television project, because in order to chop up the book, to f pare it down to a size that could fit even, even the length of a film like Gettysburg, would be very difficult. And I don't know that it could be done without radically changing the story, because what happens to these characters prior to the war and the importance of their wives and their families and what these people, where these people came from, would be lost, I think. And if you simply did one battle, <clears throat> you'd miss an awful lot of context. And so it would almost have to be done as a miniseries. Um, we have been talking to several people. Um, we are firmly in the belief that it will happen. Um, the audience clearly is there. Uh, people, I can't tell you how many people around the country on this tour have come up to me and the first question out of their mouth is, when's the film coming out? Um, we have very little control over that. Hollywood operates in a different world than the publishing business and, and probably in the world I operate in. And so we're sort of at, at other people's mercy. But the, the films do so much to help the interest in the Civil War, like very, Gettysburg. Yeah, and, and the greatest example of that is that it applies to me and my life and my family is what happened to the Killer Angels after Gettysburg came out. Uh, I mean, the extraordinary success of the Killer Angels was a direct result of the film. I mean, we, we don't take that for granted at all. So we're hopeful. So, yes, over here. Yes. You mentioned trivia. Did you ever run across how Jackson began sucking lemons? He began, Jackson began the whole lemon thing, and it was actually more than lemons. He, he um, adapted to all kinds of citrus fruit while he was in Mexico. In the Mexican War, the, many of these soldiers came down from, from North America, from the United States, uh, many from the Northeast, many were immigrants, many had never been in the South where citrus was grown. And when they arrived in, in some of the places in Mexico, it was a paradise because they ran into all kinds of fruit and vegetables and things they'd never seen before. And Jackson was definitely of that group and he just took it home with him. And the great joy, I mean, there are many myths around all of these characters, especially someone as colorful as Jackson. Um, it has been suggested that that's all a myth, that Jackson never sucked lemons. That's not true. I mean, I, uh, many of the accounts of people who were there, Sandy Pendleton, Henry Kidd Douglas, acknowledged that these lemons kept showing up. Um, there is some speculation as to where they came from. One of the little fun things about writing Gods and Generals was that that was one of the, the little games I could play because I've been asked by people, well, where did he get the lemons? As though I sort of hid the answer somewhere in the book. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are people who have offered answers to that question. I prefer to keep it a mystery. It's just, I address it a little bit as a mystery in the book. The staff officers are shaking their heads. All they know is these boxes keep showing up and the, the lemons are nestled in a bed of straw. And Pendleton says, they just keep showing up from somebody. Somebody down south keeps sending them. And that's the end of it. And I just sort of leave it at that. But the myth has, uh, it, whatever myths there are about Jackson, and there are a great number of them, um, that is one of, of, the, of the facts. Yes, anyone else? Yes. Um, for the movie, do you have anyone in mind to play Samuel Jackson? Boy, do I. Um, I can't talk about that. I have been told by the right people that um, don't do that because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I have, oh yeah, I mean, I have, I have characters that I think would be marvelous. The problem is if I mention this and, and this goes out to a large audience uh, or the right people see my answer, it could have an effect on who ultimately plays him and someone, some other actor. I mean, we're dealing with Hollywood. And unfortunately, or fortunately, and I don't bite the hand it feeds me, but certainly I have to play by Hollywood's rules. <laughs> So uh, I have been asked many times, this sort of leads me into a question that I get a great deal, particularly in the South. I've been asked many times what I think of Martin Sheen as Robert E. Lee. Um, this is a characterization by an actor that nobody could win. I mean, I don't care if you're Lawrence Olivier or Marlon Brando or Richard Burton or any of the great actors or Martin Sheen, uh, the great actors of our time. If you accept a role like this, you are not going to please a huge percentage of your audience. When you talk about Robert E. Lee, particularly in the South, uh, you're talking about a man who is regarded, well, if we have a saint in our culture, in the Southern culture, certainly it would be Robert E. Lee. I ad will always admire, regardless uh, of, of what anyone else thinks of, of Martin Sheen as Robert E. Lee, I will always admire Martin Sheen's courage for taking the role. 
I personally thought he did a fine job. Um, he portrayed the Robert E. Lee that pretty much is in The Killer Angels, and that, after all, is the point. Gettysburg is not a documentary. It's not the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's the story of these characters as they came from the Killer Angels. That's a very important distinction because my father caught all kinds of grief from people who said, well, wait a minute, what happened? why didn't you write about sickles at Gettysburg? And what about Culp's Hill? And what about the railroad cut and the peach orchard and the wheat field? And on and on and on and on. That's not what the Killer Angels is. It's not the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. The challenge that that gave to me was very clearly understood because my father's book covers four days. My book covers five years. Um, the problem with that is how do you write a book that covers five years without covering five years? Because then you end up with a 3,000 page book that nobody wants to read. Um, that was difficult. And the advantage of having four different points of view is that you can move through time by bouncing back and forth between the characters. And I, um, I was grateful for that, because if you had to follow one character and deal with this character on a day-by-day -day basis, you'd bore people to tears, because none of these people on a daily basis had particularly interesting things to do. It was all episodic. I mean, things happened in, in big bunches. Events happened in bunches. So, anyone else? I thought I saw a hand over here. Come on. Well, in, researching, yes. uh, in researching your characters, did you find that you had a different interpretation about any one character from your father's? Yes. The attempt, of course, was to take my father's characters and carry them forward and backward. And what I discovered, and this was a, a source of great controversy with the Killer Angels, my father, something else my father caught a lot of grief for, was his portrayal of Longstreet because it was a very positive portrayal. It, sh it sh attempted to shed light on Lee's actions at Gettysburg through Longstreet's point of view. And in the South, primarily, Longstreet is not especially highly regarded at Gettysburg. In fact, they needed a scapegoat, it became Longstreet. Longstreet did not do himself any favors after the war. He contributed to much of this scapegoat by his politics, by being outspoken sort of at the wrong time in the wrong place. And my father identified with the character of Longstreet very much, saw a lot of himself in this man. They were physically very similar. Um, their attitudes about life, the, the tragedies in their life, Longstreet's loss of his children. My father had a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, they saw them, my, my father saw a lot of himself in Longstreet, and that, I think, contributed a great deal to his Longstreet. As I began to research for my book, I ran into a little bit of a problem with that because the long street that I got to know was not my father's long street. And so one of the ways of dealing with that, and the best example I like to use is in The Killer Angels, most of the time you see Robert E. Lee through the eyes of long street. When you see descriptions of Lee, when you see stories about Lee, they're told in long street's mind. In Gods and Generals, you see Longstreet through the eyes of Lee, so that you get a, the complete reverse point of view. Um, I didn't really set out to do that on purpose. It just sort of evolved that way, because I was much more into telling Lee's story. And I'm, I'm very happy with the way that turned out, because there were some problems with some of the things that Longstreet did, particularly the most glaring example is Second Manassas, when Lee wanted Longstreet to advance his troops to help Jackson, and Longstreet delayed and said, no, it's not time. And regardless of the argument and who was right and who was wrong, it doesn't matter. The fact is Lee was the commanding general. Longstreet did not perform on that day. And I go into that just a little bit. It's not a controversy. I'm not trying to make a point or cause an issue. It's just that I tried to show, because I'm writing from Lee's point of view, and I'm trying to show what Lee might have thought of that and what, how he might have seen that. So there is that difference. Beyond that, I mean, the Chamberlain you see in The Killer Angels is the Chamberlain that I found. Um, certainly Lee, although I go into Lee in much more detail than my father did. Um, and also, of course, the women. Um, we learn, uh, we're, we're constantly referred in the Killer Angels to things that happened before. I mean, there's the marvelous uh, scene that's referred to in the Killer Angels between Hancock and Armstead. Uh, the parting of the ways in California, the, and, and Myra Hancock playing the piano and singing Kathleen Malvernine. Um, I had the enormous privilege of writing that scene, of, of you are there. 
Uh, you are there with Hancock, because it's told from Hancock's point of view. A difference there is that, Han that my father t tells that story from Armstead's point of view. Um, one of the reasons why, and I don't like to go into this a uh, great deal, but one of the reasons there was a definite decision to tell that story from Hancock's point of view is if there is a film, if we do a film, we do not have Richard Jordan. And for those of you who know, the late Richard Jordan portrayed Armstead in the film Gettysburg and passed away shortly after the film was completed. It would be an enormous distraction to the audience and it would be an enormous disadvantage to an actor to ask an actor to step into that role and play a dominant role in the film because people would still see Richard Jordan. Um, a great many people have expressed that to me. Uh, the, they feel his performance in the film was probably one of the best performances, or if not the best, and I agree with them. Um, his loss had an effect on me, and that it, it did make me see that I probably should tell this story from Hancock's point of view. What happened, as I said before, was a complete surprise. I learned about Hancock that this man is my father. Uh, this man was, became fascinating to write about. So, any other questions? Uh, if you have no other questions, I, I appreciate very much again you coming out. As I said before, um, that I am standing here and not Michael Shara is something I will never take for granted. And the path that has been open for me is um, a, direct, uh, a direct path from my father and the honor that I have of continuing his legacy and continuing the work that after all, if he were alive, this would be his book. And I know that for an absolute fact. Um, so it is something I carry with me everywhere I go and to every group I speak to, and I thank you very much. Very moving and memorable experience. Um, Jeff will be out in the lobby uh, signing books uh, for quite a while. I hope for a long, long time. Uh, well, not too, too long. <laughs> um, might mention that. Uh,